Hello everybody. Um, welcome to another Avid Lifesound webinar. Um, this is the first in a series of five where we're going to be previewing the new Venue 7 software which will be coming out later in the year. Myself and Rob Scoville are going to take you through um, all of the new features and, and technology involved. Uh, today Chris Lambrex and myself are going to take you through three desks gain sharing on an AVB network. Um, we've also got Ryan John, who's the, who's the principal designer of this software on the call, Robert Scoville, Champ Peck, Ricardo Mantini. Um, so feel free to pop questions and, and the answers as we go. How are you doing, Chris? Yeah, I'm fine. Thanks, Rob. Uh, and welcome from me as well. Um, maybe before we really jump into this webinar, a uh, couple of householding or housekeeping rules, if you like. Um, for attendees, uh, video and audio is uh, switched off, but we do have a Q&A section, which we do encourage you to use. Uh, you can post questions there. Uh, Robert Scoville, Chan Pack, and uh, actually Ryan, uh, Ricardo, and Dirk. Uh, there's a team of people there uh, who are going to try to answer them and also tee them up for us by the end of the webinar. So uh, I'll hand it over back to Rob, who is going to uh, start this webinar off. Yeah, so as you probably know, um, we're Avid. Um, we've been working on the SXL for several years now, and uh, we have a platform, we call it the SXL platform. Chris is gonna share a slide right now and show you how that looks. So currently we have, we have five consoles on the platform. We have three engines and, and four IO devices. Now the beautiful thing about being on this platform is all of these devices can talk to each other. And by that we mean that you start out you start on a project you can choose the surface that you need the engine that you need and whatever io devices you need and they all talk to each other right and one of the beautiful things about it being a platform is when we develop something like venue 7 this as soon as this is available it's available for every single part of the platform every single desk every single engine every single io device is updated to 7 they all work together all of the cool stuff that we're going to show you is available for all of the desks, not just the, the more expensive desks in the range, okay? Um, so, let's move in on. When we first started this, this, uh, this range of, of, uh, of consoles, um, we, we'd, we'd have to have them like kind of single, sing, single systems. And, and this is a kind of maxed out single system you can see here. It's a, it's a surface, it's an engine. Uh, we have some extra I.O. It's called uh, Local 16, which is on the uh, what we call the console ring. Yeah? Um, and that's very separate from the I.O. ring. And today we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about the I.O. ring. And just to be clear, that's separate from the console and the engine and the Pro Tools, the way those all work together. And this is the kind of the basic setup. This is a ring topology. You can see that we have uh, three, three stage boxes connected in a ring to uh, a second AVB card. And throughout this, we're going to be talking about AVB. It's, it's, the, it's the audio over IP networking that we use. Um, Chris, let you, why don't you take away for the next thing? You know, yes, as I said, um, ring, topo ring, ring topology, maybe explain a little bit about network topology and, and what we're talking about when, we, when I say a ring. A ring. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're basically going to talk about two topologies here today, a ring topology and a star topology. But just to be clear on what the topology is or a network topology, basically a topology defines how the different devices or how the different components uh, which have to communicate on a network talk to each other, right? Um, so if you look at a ring topology, basically a ring topology is exactly how the word describes it. You have a number of devices, they all hook uh, up together and they they sort of form a ring, right? And if we go back to that slide that we were showing earlier and specifically look at the stage ring, um, all, our, all our devices, whether it's a console or an engine or, or a stage IO device, the network cards in there have two ports, right? An A and a B port. Uh, now that's very important to keep in mind. Uh, in a ring topology, we just follow standard procedure by going, an A port connects to a B port, uh, so you go A to B on a stage box, and then A to B on the next one, A to B, A to B, until you close the ring back to the engine, right? And what that does is it also gives us a form of redundancy. If any of these connections breaks, the, the, the data or the, the audio stream, if you like in this case, will always find its way back one way or the other, to that engine, right? So that gives you, si and actually that redundancy is silent, right? So if you break one of those redundancies without a drop of audio, you um, 
get that redundant ring topology, right? Um, now, what's also possible on a ring is I.O. sharing. And what I.O. sharing really means is you take two systems. Uh, so we have two engines here. We're looking at, call it engine A and engine B. Uh, each engine has its own uh, console and local I.O. And each engine can also, you know, each system also has its local uh, Pro Tools system there for virtual sound check, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then the stage ring is where you share resources between the two systems, right? So we're sharing three uh, stage 64s here. Um, and, you know, you have your nice closed ring and that's all very fine, but it's also finite in terms of how much you can do. Um, we're limited to, uh, on, we're, we're working on a one gigabit network, which means that we're limited to a maximum of seven hops. And a hop, you basically look at a hop as um, a connection between two devices. So anytime you go from one device to another, you add a hop. Now think of adding stage boxes and potentially more consoles, that makes a ring very limited because once you run out of those seven hops, that's it, you're done, right? In comes star topology. Now what's a star topology? It's basically a central point where everything hooks up. In our case, this is going to be a switch. Uh, so we take all those devices which are on uh, a stage ring and we work with two switches actually. So we have an A and a B port, so we also take an A and the B switch. You could actually do this on one switch, but you sort of defeat the purpose of having that double redundancy going. So we stick to an A switch, all the A ports hook up to an A switch, all the B ports hook up to a B switch. The hop restrictions, they don't exactly go away, but you have less of them. Anytime you go from an engine to a switch that's one hop, and then um, uh, another hop to go to the stage uh, IO devices, right? So it will allow us to do way more complex systems that we would be able to do on a ring topology. And if you then look at what we previously supported as well, which is um, just two systems IO sharing, there's a graphical display of how that looks. Uh, so two independent systems, local ring, console connects to the engine, the stage ring, all the A ports go to the A switch and all the B ports go to the B switch, right? Next step here, and this is not possible on a stage ring because of that hop restriction. Next step here is the following slide, which is three systems IO sharing. And that's actually what this uh, webinar is all about. And we actually show this later on with three physical systems, if you like, how that works. Um, but basically the same thing, all the A ports of all three systems, in this case, the three engines, connect to an A switch, all the B ports connect to the B switch. Stage I.O., no change there, but it does allow us to now suddenly change all of this, um, you know, all these, these input sources or resources, if you like, between three systems. And that's uh, a big next step, right? So Rob will now take you through uh, what this gain sharing is all about. So back over to you, Rob. Yeah, so gain sharing. Of course, what we're seeing now is we're seeing three desks addressing the same preamp. There's only a single preamp. So how does that work in the real world? How does that work when an engineer walks up to the desk? How does he or she work in this environment? So we got a little, we just thrown up a little picture here. So we're just going to talk about, to begin with, just two desk gain sharing. And we're going to talk about the general concepts of true gain. It's a, it's a, it's a technology we've had for a few years now. We studied it with S3L and it works very seamlessly, works very smoothly. Uh, personally, I've done a few tours with it now and uh, without any issue. And this is the way to think of it. There's only one preamp, right? There's an analog preamp. Um, so that means that we have to have a master and a slave, right? Maybe unfortunate terminology, primary and secondary consoles. But actually, in, without, with, throughout our um, design description, we use master and slave. So the master has control of the actual preamp, yeah? With gain and the pad. And the slave has a virtual preamp, right? Has a gain and a pad, which is virtual. So the first example we're looking at, the master sets the, the gain to 40 dB for a microphone. And the slave, for whatever reason, chooses a slightly different level and chooses 38.2, right? Underneath the hood, the system itself has given a, a digital trim and it's trimmed it down by 1.8 decibels, right? So 
what will happen then if the slave changes that game, right? So what happens in the next thing is that the slave actually decides, actually, I need to just turn the gain up a little bit, and it turns the gain up, and it, you just, it just responds as if you turn up a preamp, right? It just gets louder, your level comes up, and actually what's happened now, because it's going to 41.3, it's gone above the master gain, it's actually just trimmed it up. It's given it a little boost of 1.3 decibel with uh, a digital trim. So this is all happening in real time. You can't hear the audio changing in either of the two desks. And I will show you this. What will happen next is the master decides to turn the gain up. So the master is going up to 42.5 decibels. The slave has stayed at 41.3, but now the trim has gone down to minus 1.2, right? And as the master is going up 0.1 of a decibel at a time, the slave is going down 0.1 of a decibel at a time. In, in, in conjunction with each other, so you don't hear the audio changing. So actually, the kind of technology underneath is reasonably complicated, but the actual experience of an engineer standing behind this and working with this is, honestly, after a couple of days in your production rehearsal, you just forget that you're not controlling a preamp. It just feels uh, as if, actually, you even forget who's the master and who's the slave of, of the preamp after a little while. Actually, I remember us uh, demoing this uh even back in the S3L days, right, Rob, uh, when, when we had this uh, I.O. sharing thing as well. And where we would do this sneaky thing where we would tell the engineers like, hey, here's an input source. And, you know, you just now make your gain structure and they would dial in the gain, which is the parameter they were working with. And then afterwards, we would tell them, like, actually, you did not own this mic pre. And nobody was ever able to tell that they were controlling the mic pre or just trimming off what was said yeah. that they had them by the master, right? So um, you, you completely yeah. forget it's, it's just it. it's very it's a very natural, intuitive uh, feel to the whole thing. Right, so that's the kind of theory of it. We're going to move on now, and Chris has got three desks in his studio in Belgium. I'm at home in Spain in my little studio, and uh, we've just we've just going to talk you through how this whole thing works. We're going to do a little bit Q and A, but maybe at the end of this section, we'll keep going for a little while, and then. Uh, we'll, address your questions after that. Right, so how does this work in, in real terms? So Chris has got three desks in his studio. Um, he's remoted into the, the, the software of all three desks. Uh, we've got a 24C, a 16C, and a 48D. Right, so here's a 24C. There's a 16C, you can see the top right-hand corner. And then he's gonna to go to the 48D. And there's the 48D, okay. You can see that there's one stage device. We've tried to keep this as simple as possible. So we have one stage 64 that we're going to work with. Um, so Chris, so how do you how do you how do you take control of this stage box? How do you become the master of this stage box? It's very simple. You click on it, you click connect. You choose the slot that you want it to go to. Choose the slot one, I'd say. And then there you go. You can see it says in master. That means it's it's the master of the inputs, and it says out claimed. That means it's also controlling all of the outputs. Let's see how that looks on the other desk, Chris. So you go to the GUI of the 16C. You can now see the stage box is automatically connected to the 16C, and it says in slave. It's a slave to the preamps. And out wave, that means it does not have access to the outputs at this point. And then the, the last one is the 24C, which is exactly the same, right? So. What about if we want to change who is the master of that preamp for whatever reason? Um, what we have to do is we go back to the 48D, we disconnect that stage box. So now it's available on the network. Go Which back to the 24C. To? Yeah, 24C. it's available on the 16C. And then there we are on the 24C. Again, connect it, choose a slot. And now, there you go. This is 24C is now the master. So it's, it's that simple, you, it's, it's really quick. Basically, whoever gets out of bed in the morning, pulls it in first, is the master of the stage box. Right, so let's have a look at how that looks in the GUI in terms on the inputs page, Chris. Let's jump to the inputs page on the 24C. So you can see we've got a little bit of audio playing. Um, it's, a, it's a nice little elbow session we've got. We're not gonna play you any audio today. It doesn't really work over the internet. Uh, what I'd like to point out is we're going to work on the vocal channel of, of this session. You can see it says Vox in the top left-hand corner, and underneath it, the patch information is, is shown in green. That means that you're working as a master of the preamp, okay? So Chris is just going to pull the gain up to some kind of reasonable level. Oh, or no, he's, no, he's going to show okay. you. No, he's no, going no, to show no, you no. the input. Okay. No, yeah, do that. Show the input. Oh, sorry, my fault. Show the input on the other desks. 
to okay. show that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, man. Uh, no, you can I'm see it's yellow. Follow. It's fine. Yeah. It's yellow there. Uh, it's yellow yeah. on, on the second desk. Um, so what we're going to do, all three desks are at, at plus 10, and we're going to just start playing with the gain and show you how that works. There's the third desk, again, at plus 10. Right. So 24C, which is the master. Let's go there. Let's just gain it up to a, a reasonable level, Chris. I don't know, 35 dB or something uh, like that. Okay. Whatever looks, whatever looks about right. Uh, oh, that's actually a miracle. I managed Look that. Look at with that. The mouse. Fantastic. So, made the math okay. a lot easier. 35. Isn't it? <laughs> Thanks, bud. Okay. Right. So there you go. Look at that. There's the 30, 35 dB. This nice little bit of input gain going on in there. Um, that's how, so we can see it's just, just, it's, uh, it's, it's peaking around about, I don't know, whatever that is, plus six, plus nine or something. Let's go to the second desk. And we're still at plus 10. You can see this metering lower is a slave desk. Even though it's a slave desk, the metering is showing the, the current value of the preamp. It's a virtual preamp because it's going to gain up more or less into that kind of position, 31.7. So what's that? Uh, I'll make the difference obvious. So 3.3 uh, downward trim. On the uh, on the digital trim that's hidden underneath, and we're going to explain why we've chosen to work in this manner later on, and why it's important, and why it's going to help you with your show file comp compatibility, moving between systems and stuff. Okay, come on to the third desk. Again, getting it up to some kind of level. Oops, I'll make that a little bit harder. Yeah, okay, somewhere in that neighborhood. It's fine. There you go. So now we have three three desks sharing the same mic pre. They all have different values. They're, sh they're showing the metering in, in relative to the value that they've they've chosen on their own system. So let's go back to the master desk and make it hot, Chris. Let's turn it up a little bit. Turn it up to no, maybe just type it in even. Type it into forty five. Yeah, that's a good idea actually. Forty five. There we go. Almost. So there you go. Yeah. Quite fierce. Still be great. Um. Second desk, see how that's affected the second desk. 16C hasn't affected at all, still got the same metering as it had before, right? But now that's at 45, so we're trimming by whatever that is, 13.3 decibel down. Um, trimming down, no problem. Trim down all you want. Uh, go to the 48D, 39.2, so that's trimmed down by 5.8, right? So, um, up to this point, everything's beautiful. Uh, is, if you're trimming down, there's never ever an issue. Let's let's go back to the the master desk, Chris. Yep. And just uh, take it take it down to plus twenty, just as an example. Going to type it in again. Go. So I, I talk and he operates. It's, it's easier to do, one of us to do each one or the other. Right. Yeah, we're doing so this COVID proof, right? So we're... It's sorry. COVID proof, yeah. It's this proper social distancing. We're about a thousand <laughs> miles apart. Um, yeah. Right. So where were we? We're looking at the master. It's at plus 20. So let's quickly look at the other two desks. So the 16 C is first, I believe. Right. There you go. It's still showing the same metering. It's at 31.7. So what we're doing here is actually we're using the trim is boosting by 21.7, right? So a word of caution here. This is the one place where you can make a mistake with true gain. There's a one little area where you might um, affect the quality of your audio. Now, what's happened is we've gained down the master. We've, we've, we've got a digital trim that's boosting by 21 decibels on the slave. So what's it going to do? Of course, it's going to boost the noise floor as well, right? The signal to noise ratio is not ideal. So you're going to get a little bit of noise now down this, down this slave, uh, slave channel. And this is the, just a little word of caution. You'll notice it straight away. It's very simply fixed by uh, getting on the combs and, and reminding the person who's controlling this preamp that they might want to get it in a more reasonable level. This will only happen if, say, for example, somebody's using a... a um, Somebody's the master of, of, of the mic piece. The only time I've done it was when uh, it was a comms mic. I had a comms mic in one of my stage boxes and I forgot to level that up. And uh, the monitor engineer soon jumped on the phone and reminded me of my responsibility. So, yeah, it's not an issue, but it's worth mentioning since we're here. And let's have a look at the third desk, Chris, just, just in terms of completeness. 
39.2. So yeah, it's, it's, he's, he's boosted 19.2 or she's boosted by 19.2. It's uh, beyond about 13, 14 dB, you start to hear a bit of noise and you just need to remind the other person. You're not going to get any, any clips or bangs or drops or anything. It's just, you're just going to be, you're just amplifying the noise floor. That's just physics. There's nothing much we can do about that. Right. This is where Chris is going to run around and do this in real time. So if you go back to the master screen, Chris, yeah, okay, which is the twenty four C, yeah, and which is behind him, just to prove this is not just yep. theoretical, right? This is actually okay. us trying to prove that we're doing this in real time. Here's Chris changing the preamp. Does it work? Yeah, there we go. I should do this. There here. you go, up and down. Yeah. No, maybe whilst I do this, I'll uh, switch back to. Um, the 24 and i'm still turning changing the gain on yeah uh, well actually you're looking at the 16 but and i'm you're changing, changing the gain, gain on the 24 c right. and you can see hopefully that there's yeah. no there's no change so it's, it's the same exercise but we're just doing it in, in person normally when we do this in person before all the COVID nonsense madness um we and there was actually the change microphone. on the on the 16 as well all so right can... there you go just just put it through the roof on the 16. Okay, beautiful. So that's the inputs. I hope that's clear. Uh, as I said, at the end of the section, we, we can have some Q&A if, if we haven't made that completely clear. So we, I think we, we, we're clear on the inputs. There's one preamp. The master takes control of that preamp. There's two uh, virtual preamps that the secondary discs are, are using. Uh, no problem to, 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 to be louder than the master. Be a little bit careful if you're a whole lot quieter than the master, you, you will hear some noise for. Right, let's look at the, the outputs, Chris. So, master desk options devices, I believe. Yeah. Right, so here we go. Uh, you see on the right hand side, it says in master, out claimed. We select that stage box, and on the left hand side, we go to settings, and here you'll see that there's four slots to the stage 64, J, K, L, and M. Uh, so, what we're going to do is we're going to give one card to each of the two desks so that they can patch to uh, the patch bay. But before we do that, let's have a look at the patch base just to see where we're at before we change anything. So there's the master desk. We've got four cards available to patch. Uh, let's go to the 16C. Uh, and you can see it's all grayed out. So the 16C does not have access to the output cards, cannot patch to it. And then just to confirm it let's go to the 48d just to just to prove it yeah and there's the little w icon as well to to indicate that that card is actually very good yeah so the waved, the, right, so. waved and, and it's yellow and 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 in the master you'll see it's green and c for claimed yeah, yeah? yeah exactly okay so let's go back to the options devices on the master again right so let's give um, L to the 16C, and you do that by clicking on the little downward pressing arrow, facing arrow, choose 16C. And then let's give the last card to the 48D, again on the little arrow that's pointing down. Let's have a look at the patch bay first on the master. Okay, so the two cards available to patch, two cards grayed out, we don't have access to them anymore. 16C should be the third card available. There it is. The first two and the last one are not available. And, and remember, we said yellow for waved and, and green for for um, claimed. Claimed. Thank you. I went blank there for a second. <laughs> Old age. Um, got the forty eight D. And then the last the last card is is, is there sitting there on the uh, available to be patched to. Right. So very simple. Um, there's a master controls the front end. The slaves have a digital trim under the hood so that they can just work in gain anyway. And then we can choose on a per card basis who has access to send it out to the outputs, right? Um, one last little thing. So it's an intelligent stage box. It has memory. So what happens if we disconnect the stage box in the master? So you just disconnect the stage box, right? So now it's out. It's, again, it's available as a device. And now we're going to reconnect it. See what happens. We get an information message that says a stage rack was previously connected to this slot. Would you like to recall the previous output 
slot sharing configuration, yes or well, yes, you know, unless we've changed the band. But uh, at that point, you can see claim, claim, and waved, waved. So it, it memorizes down. the state of the console, even and if you lost power on the stage or something for a second. Okay. So that's the end of that first part of the section. Dirk, is there any Q&A coming at this point that we need to address? Is, has anybody not understood that? If, if you don't see anything, I'll assume that there uh, isn't, and, and we'll yeah. move on. But hello, yeah, mate. Yeah. Okay. Um, shall we dive into the... So, yeah, Chris, why don't you do show us, explain to us a little bit about how we hook up a star network, yeah. what the switches look like, how all of that works. Right. Maybe for uh, going into the switches, let's go back to this slide, right? And, and just uh, physically, yeah. well, actually on a graphic uh, display, look, look at how this is hooked up. Three consoles, um, two switches, one stage box in this case, all the A's go to the A switch, all the B's go to the B switch, right? Now let's go into the switch management software. Um, and there's this uh, little piece of software. I am looking for it. There it is. Um, so this is RNAO. RNAO is uh, a management diagnostics tool by Luminex. Uh, the, the switches that we support for our star topologies uh, are Luminex switches. Um, and um, well, one of the things I person like really about the Luminex switches is that they're so easy to management, right? So. Um, I actually remember a couple of years ago when we en went into this switch you know, stories uh, back in the S3L days, actually, uh, the first switches we got in and it took me two days. We had to hook up serial ports to USB converters and then Putty, it was a little diagnostics tool called Putty and then you had to write code <laughs> even to get the switch up and running, right? Yeah, so, I, I remember it really well. Uh, the two of us were sat in that room trying to get that work for about yeah, two days. Exactly. I think. <laughs> I think I, I gave up after about the first hour and a half or something and read my book while you try to work it out. But uh, this is so much easier, right? A little bit easier for, for you know, people like me, no IT background whatsoever, uh, just easy to use. Um, and, and actually, here's my A switch and here's my B switch, right? So on the left-hand side, I've called it Luminex A, Loom A and Loom B. You can see the IP address. We'll get into that in a little while. Um, so 192.168.11. 100 for the A switch, 12, 100 for the B switch. But I can also show the devices that are actually connected. So if I hook up, you know, I've, I've obviously prepared this a little bit. So I've made little groups of um, where I store devices. Um, we're using three engines, right? So these are my engines and this is how they hook up. Here's my 16C, here's my 48D, and here's my 24C E6L, right? And if I move this, you can see to which port they are connected. So on the switch, that would be ports 9, 11, and 12. If I open up the stage I.O., there's my one stage 64. A port goes to the A switch, B port goes to the B switch. So that's really a different graphical representation of what my physical network looks like, right? Um, what RNA also allows me to do is to monitor what's going on and if i click one of these switches it will show me here in the bottom part where i've you know selected avb um, i can see those devices as well and actually i can see what kind of bandwidth these devices are taking up and this is actually an interesting part about avb um, you know one, one of the reasons why i haven't chose avb as a protocol as well is that there's this guarantee there's this quality of service there's this bandwidth reservation going on whenever you connect the device uh, that speaks avb to one of these ports you know, on the sending and the receiving end it will take up 75 percent of that bandwidth right 75 percent of that bandwidth is now exclusively reserved for avb transmission right so whatever data is sent over that switch you know I can be sure that I won't get pops and clicks and dropouts because I reserve that bandwidth, right? For both my inputs and my outputs, actually. Right? Yeah. So um, just to be just to kind of reinforce that, the, the important thing about this is this switch might be used to be sending video, data, internet, whatever as well. But whatever happens, whatever else happens apart from AVB can only exist in the 25%. It cannot touch the 75%. And this is the way that we can guarantee quality of service, this is the way that we can guarantee that the audio will always arrive there. It doesn't matter how many other packets are flying around. It's not, it's not the same on other networks. On AVB, it's guaranteed because your audio, we know exactly how much bandwidth we need for it, even maxed out. 
it will be guaranteed to get there. And it will be guaranteed to get there phase accurate, sample accurate in phase, even if you're on two different devices, the left and the right will leave at the same time. Exactly. Sorry to jump um, in, Chris, but carry on. Yeah, no, no worries. Uh, it's good. Um, one one other thing I can I can show you, which is really interesting. You know, I have an A and a B switch. I can actually look at my active stream. So obviously we have uh, an, uh, an active connection and a redundant connection. And if I hover hover over, you know, I have ins and outs. If I hover over these ins, well, this tells me now that my A stream is actually the active stream. The B stream is the backup, right? Um, on the right hand side, you see the stage box. These are my inputs, and you know the inputs are being controlled by these three desks. I'm sharing the inputs to these three desks, right? Um, same thing for the second input stream. Um, it's a great, it's a great graphic. It's a great way to to explain sharing over a network, right? It's yeah. very obvious, right there. Sorry, carry on. And then on the output side, remember that we uh, sort of divided those outputs over three systems. Well, here's my. Uh, first output stream, uh, that's the 24C uh, that, that owns those outputs. You can see that stream clearly going to the, the stage 64. Uh, second stream as well. And there, well, remember we had one for each desk then. There's my 48D output stream. And actually, I can look at my 16C output stream as well, right? So, um, that's maybe cool. a little that's, bit more. But maybe you could show us how, how, how you can figure that from earlier on you know it's easy people go oh well it's easy for them to kind of set all this up like maybe show from from the, the get-go how you would you know enable okay. avb on um, those ports and stuff so so maybe let's go go right back to the beginning I'll, I'll just log into one of these switches and the way i do this i just double click and then hopefully yes it does it opens up a browser um type in my uh secret uh login and password uh hit enter and um, admin space yeah maybe. yes <laughs> Um, it's not hooked up to the internet, so you can't log into it from remote. Um, so uh, only a couple of things that I show you. This, this, this is now, you're, you're straight into the switch, right? You're not into code. You're actually looking at something that graphically allows you to do. So global, for example, uh, is where I can set my IP address. I can set, this is actually really important as well uh, for us. It's the subnet mask. So we, we give all these switches uh, their dedicated IP address, but we also want to sort of hide them from each other. And the way we do this is by giving them a subnet mask so they don't see each other. So the subnet in this case is 255.255.255.0, right? Um, so, and it's actually the last 255 part that makes it invisible for the other switches. We can spend an entire webinar on this maybe at some point. Be yeah, sure. but just to, be, uh, just, to, just to clear up, so we got, we got 168.11 on one, 168.12 on the other. And yes. and because that's the third the third part the third two five five hides them from each other right they can yes. have the same fourth yeah. fourth part to the IP address right where it really gets interesting for us is in this groups uh, section right so you see a couple of different colors up here you see these green colors and actually these green colors you know think of groups uh, exactly what it is it's a number of ports that you assign to a group and those ports within that group can speak to each other right. It's an easy way of explaining what a VLAN is. Luminex allows us to work with groups. You now, in in IT, you know, jargon or, or you know, IT speak, uh, you call those VLANs, right? Um, you have this little dial here. There's a bunch of groups that you can select, um, and I've chosen for the green group. I've named that AVB on. Uh, when you first use a switch, you have to declare AVB to a group. So I've chosen for group number three. In the advanced mode, it's as simple as checking the AVB box, hitting apply, and now that group is AVB capable, right? Only one group on these switches can be AVB capable, also because of the bandwidth. You cannot divide that bandwidth uh, over several groups, but you know, um, there's where you go. Um, and then maybe I should go back to uh, Araneo. Uh, yeah, because, because, because AVB claims 75% of 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 the network, you, you can't have two sets of eight of AVB on on the yeah. switch. Yeah. From here on, I can actually do this from RNA. Or, you know, the the dial-in part to these separate switches. Yeah, that's fine. But you know, most of the stuff you can actually do from here. Um, 
And as an example, I'll, I'll show you how to do that. For example, if we wanted to add a bunch of stage boxes on this, this network, well, we, have to, we would have to declare a couple of more ports to be AVB capable. So let's do that uh, in sequence. Um, you know, I can just select the ports. You know, this is my A switch, but I also want my B ports. I can go to my B switch, select those ports as well, and then assign AVB to those ports. And that now makes those ports AVB capable as well. All I need to do is hook up stage boxes to that and the devices page on my system will show those available devices then as well, right? Um, you got some other stuff of, on the switch, Chris? I believe yeah, you got some other stuff yeah. that you can show people what, what else. So you, you can put other stuff on the switch. It's gonna be really useful in, in, uh, in, in installations and even in concerts to, to, to do this. Yeah, actually, and, and without even assigning this to groups, I, I have a little box that says ECX connections, and go. it's exactly that. Um, it's the ECX ports, uh, which allow me this remote into this desk, so the, the external GUIs uh, that I'm VNCing into. Well, this is how I do it in the management group, which is sort of the default group. Um, I've assigned the ECX port. That's what allows, but the ECX port is completely separate from that other VLAN, uh, which is the, the AVB. Um, and I can just control that from here. You could send PA management stuff on there. If you're working in an immersive environment, you know, the, AV, uh, the ECX port is what allows us to control plugins for things like Flux or uh, SPAT Revolution, you know, ELISA systems, uh, you know, Soundscape systems, all, all those control platforms can, hook up, can be hooked up to the same switch. Um, even more so, um, I can, I can, for example, uh, if I have some Dante streams going on, I can go look. This switch has a couple of Dante ports on there as well. Assign that, and those would now be on my virtual Dante network, right? Or uh, I also have an internet. If I want wired internet, for example, front of house wants internet. Well, I can send yeah, definitely wired do. internet to front of house, right? Um, and there you go. Um, so I think uh, that sort of covers the part for um, the switches. Switching. Right? Did very I miss cool. anything? Very, very yeah. cool. No, I think I think that's really clear. It's a lovely, lovely bit of software. They've really developed this software over the last few months, and it's just it's very nicely designed. I think it's very self-explanatory. So basically, before uh, we get to the Q and &E, I, I I just want to I just you know I, I think we can round this off by going. Why is all of this important? You know, why, why, why even bother with all of this stuff? You know, shall I stop the share at this point, Rob? Maybe? I think you should stop the share, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful as that software is. Um, we got Robert Scoville and Ryan on here as well, and I'm, you know, we're going to throw this open soon. But I just wanted to make a couple of points, right? Why, why true gain? Um, I, I touched on it earlier. Why, why not just have you know somebody controls the master, somebody else has a digital trim that goes zero in the middle and minus ten one side and plus 10 on the other. One of the things that we always, always work hard on in Avid is making sure that your show files are compatible, right? So imagine from back in the day, you got two profile show files from 12 years ago. Somebody got divorced in the band, they're back out on tour. Have you got the old show file? Yeah, we have. We're gonna use two SXLs gain sharing, right? You can literally drop the, the profile front of house in to one desk, the profile monitor show in to the other desk, connect up the stage boxes, and just work it out. Your your gain structure that you had all those years ago will just drop in right in place, whether you're master or the slave in this setup, which is spectacular. Another reason that we, we work with gain rather than trim is to imagine you're on tour, two, two bands, two desks sharing, maybe even three desks, maybe it's front of house, monitors, and a broadcast mix, right? You, you, you're on tour, you turn up someplace at a festival, you've got to use the house control because it's all, it's all wired in, and they've got to set up with an analog split. You just, the master desk, no problem. Of course, you, of course, you just drop in your show file it is as, as it should be. The slave desk drops in the show file is now controlling a preamp. And you said, you know, do you want to control these preamps? Yes, I do. And the value that you've set in your slave setup is, is, a, is a finite number, right? It's a gross number. It's the, it's the mic pre plus or minus the trim. It's a finite number. And that is applied then to the analog preamp as soon as you recall your show file. So it's, it's, it's pretty cool moving forward. It's pretty great that you can have this kind of control, right? The other reason that we work with gain is, again, show file compatibility. You might have different snapshots where you change gain throughout your, sh your show, 
Uh, an example I always use is uh, you have one DI box with three or four different acoustic guitars. They have slightly different impedances and you, you're trimming the gain on that DI box. And that, that's stored with your snapshots. You maintain that workflow, you maintain that show file, whether you're in a master position or a slave position. Right, and, and it's it's just a it just makes your life so much easier moving forward. That's why we've chosen to use a gain, a real gain, and a virtual gain. Um, advantages of of um, of of gain sharing. Uh, the first one, of course, is is easier to set up. That whole mountains of copper, one hundred ninety two inputs we had on that, on on the radio head, mountains of copper in a in a analog split between two sets of three stage boxes. Really hard to set up. Puzzies, mispatches every day it was a nightmare. <sighs> Transport costs, right? So instead of all of that, we stripped it down to three stage boxes. And the reason we did that is we were doing our South American tour. We were flying between shows. We were flying the control. We had a 747 that all our control went in between each each concert. And and the production had asked us to try and, and cut a little bit of weight and a little bit of bulk because you can imagine how expensive each kilo is. Six weeks of, of a rental of a 747. So, um, we did, and uh, so we trimmed it down to, uh, to just three stage boxes rather than six and, and, and a bunch of splits. And uh, the final thing that happened, which was one we hadn't, hadn't even thought about really, was um, the audio quality, right? So we'd got rid of this because it was less space stage left, it was easier to patch, it was gonna cost us less to travel it around. And I remember Mike Prada, my great friend Mike Prada, plugging in the mic for the first time and giving it the first one, two of the, of the tour in a, in a gain share, and he went, wow, What's changed? It sounds way better. And we were both a bit puzzled for a second and we were a little bit freaked actually. Then we went, oh, of course, because it's not going through all of that copper, it's not going through that split, you know? Um, and it was a kind of byproduct. And now we can do that with three system front of house, monitors broadcast, or it might be, you know, orchestra and band at front of house and, and a monitor desk. It might be uh, the front of house and two monitor engineers for the artist and the band or whatever, whatever it is. It's a, it's, a, it's a great workflow, it, it makes your life easier, and, and, it, and it sounds better. Uh, Mr. Scoville, have you got anything you want, personal experience you want to add to that while we're here? We've, we've kind of flown through this, we've got a little bit of time. You Let's know, the only thing I, I think I would add to it is just uh, the exciting part of it is to get it on StarPoint, right? It's just so much easier to set up. Uh, and manage, yeah. uh, especially when we go to three systems, you know, we're creating a redundant ring in that uh, in that kind of environment, especially in a big environment where you're in arenas or stadiums that can get pretty unwieldy. So, you know, it's just going to make the whole process so much easier, uh, you know, one one whole step easier doing it in StarPoint. I'm, I'm really excited for that piece of it. Very cool. Totally agree. Totally agree. I'm all for making our lives easier. If we ever get back to doing concerts, let's assume that we are going to get back to doing concerts at some stage and I'm allowed out of this little darkened room that I've been in for the last nine months, going slightly crazy. Um, Derek, any, any, any questions from the crowd? We, you, we, can, we, got Christian, we got Ryan on and, and Chan, yeah. we got Ricotto. Yeah, um, absolutely, we got some good questions here. Um, Great, man. Uh, the first one here, uh, first question is, on the IO sharing, when card assignments are made, but you want to make a change to who has the heading amp, Will the output card assignment be maintained? I, I didn't hear that question very well, Dirk. No, did you hear it, Chris? You answer it. No, 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 I, I, I didn't. Uh, um, you need to right. speak up or get closer to your mic or something. Yeah. On the IO sharing, when card assignments are made, but you want to make a change to who has the head amp, will the output card assignment be maintained? Ah, genius question. Yes. Uh, um, maybe Ryan no, John. Um, I, I don't think it is. I don't, I don't think it is. I think so. if you, if you no. reassign it to a different desk, it it, yeah. it it cleans it clears out the output cards. You'd you'd have to you'd have to you'd have to manually reassign it. Your patch will be there. It'll just take you two seconds to you know wave and claim. Um, but no, it, when you yeah, when you go card. from one if you, you go from master to slave on two different systems, it, it wipes it wipes those output cards. There's only four, right? So yeah, good question though. It will keep, I'm sure it will keep the soft patch though. So whatever you have patched in. Yeah, it'll keep your soft patch in, in, in your actual then, software, but it will not keep uh, claimed and waived. Yeah. That's correct. Totally correct. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> you. That would be embarrassing. 
but good right. question. Yeah, um, um, can can you maybe clarify what you know what happens in this configuration uh, if, if if the master gain is clipping, right? If the head amp is clipping. Uh, yeah, that 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 will be clipping everywhere. Yeah. That would be a, that would be the angry phone call. What are you doing, man? The head amp's clipping. <laughs> I'm guessing you know the, the the theory being you know that um, if you got three three people working three desks. Um, high-end desks at, at, at a concert. Hopefully, the person that's in charge of the preamps is not going to be the kind of person that would would clip them. But if they are, you need to, yeah, there's, yeah, there's, you know, you'll hear it before you see it, and you have to work really. Re I don't know if you work with an SXL, you have to work really, really hard to clip the the front end of of these desks, yeah. and, and you'll hear it. And uh, yeah. That's just, that's it's just an A to D conversion, point. right? So uh, there's there's an A to D path in there. Digital distortion does not sound nice. Um, if you clip that mic pre and you clip the A to D conversion, well, then all the nastiness is going to come out. Uh, that's you know, that's how A to D conversions work. Um, yeah. So. All right. uh, like we always say, you know, you you, you assume that there's grown ups uh, yeah. controlling the, the front end. Um, another question here, um, if you have a longer run of cable, let's say more than 100 meters for the broadcast desk, can you connect another Luminex switch on the ring to extend the distance with the optical connectors on it? Yes. So, um, yeah, there's a number of things. First of all, uh, the, most of the Luminex switches, I, I think all of them actually uh, have fiber ports on them. Yeah. So you might not have to uh, jump through an extra switch um you know for example the switches i was showing they have a total of i think even six uh fiber ports on them so yeah you can more than 100 meters multi-mode single mode just you know all our system components as well uh, all our network cards on our devices have fiber slots um you can add fiber slots to that you know, there, there might be situations where that is uh, not possible um in which case um uh, you know, you, you can use trunk ports, right? And Luminex calls them ISL, inter-switch linking. They have inter-switch links that, that go on. Um, it just becomes a little bit more complex uh, in terms of how and what. So before you do that, I would, you know, figure out what exactly it is that you need to do, what exactly it is you need to stream over there. Um, it, it becomes more complex in terms of bandwidth. On a single switch, what you have is you have one gigabit streams um, on send and receive, so each port has that bandwidth. And actually on that bandwidth, maybe something I quickly want to rec rectify, AVB takes up 75% uh, of the bandwidth, but um, from that 75%, if only, let's say, 25% is in use, that other, you know, whatever is remaining, whatever is not being used by AVB is available for other protocols until AVB claims that, right? AVB will throw whatever is necessary off until it fills that 75%, right? But, you know, if you work with an ISL port, you would have to, um, you know, link the switch through a single port again, and that single port is a one gigabit send and receive. So you have to be a little bit careful there to distribute your bandwidth correctly or set up two ISL ports to a switch, et cetera, et cetera. But it becomes more uh, more and more that's, complex. That's, that's, more of a, that's more of the kind of thing that you would do in, in an installation where we're, maybe yes. you had an amp room in the bowels of a theater and you just you just wanted to go have a switch down in the amp room. So it'd be, yeah. Um, so you could just extend your A switch down into the amp room, right? That'd be the kind of... Yeah. Way to do it, yeah. I hope that right. answered the question. So, yeah. Um, also, hop. Uh, sorry, one one last thing about it. When you add a switch, you then add a hop. So you cannot endlessly add switches and then add I/O devices. So you still have that seven hop limitation on a one gigabit network in AVB, right? So one gig each way as well, right? Yes. All right, so uh, can you talk a little bit about how the Pro Tools recording uh, fits into this or if it's, you know, it's like how it's related to uh, to the I.O. sharing? Very cool. We, you know, we, had, we we were going to do a little section on this and we thought maybe we were gonna, it was going to take up too much time. Uh, Chris, do you want to grab this? We, we've we've um, done a lot of hand-holding for people over the last couple of years. Yeah. We've been uh, sharing and, and recording. So 
You've I mean, I can definitely this. start it off. Uh, we we now support uh, uh, actually redundant recordings on each desk in in a three system I/O sharing. That is no different. Uh, each system can have and and maybe uh, if you allow me, I'll I'll quickly share this uh, schematics again of the three systems so we can look at this. Um, stand by. So that should be this one. Hey, Chris, can uh, I interrupt you just for a second? Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, it might be worth noting that we do have a video on the website that I put together uh, some time back that covers all of this recording uh, situation with a gain shared system as well. So, uh, you know, if you don't want to go too far down in the rabbit hole, maybe we'll direct people there. Robert, do you, do you want to take this with this schematics and explain how that works just briefly here in the webinar? Um, well, I mean, the main thing to understand with uh, input sharing and gain tracking and recording is that any recorder you attach to any of these systems is going to get its record level from the master preamp setting, right? That's that's the main thing to understand with it. So uh, the master console is always going to have uh, essentially control of setting the record level. During playback, all of the offset uh, that Rob was talking about, the push-pull that happens between the pre uh, and the uh, trims be uh, between master and slaves all takes place so that the, all of those Pro Tools systems actually play back at the right level. Uh, it's the same sort of push-pull that happens there. Uh, yeah, I, I think, I think the, the, main, the main point is make sure that the recording that you're using for your virtual sound check is one that you've made in the position that you were in with it when you were a slave or a master, right? Um, you know, so, you yeah, can't... It's, that's the caveat with it, right? Yeah. Is that if you are making uh, preamp changes, whether they're manual or snapshotted, uh, you need to be able to track those changes in place uh, if the slave consoles are going to work in virtual sound check at those locations, right? Do you follow me there? Meaning yeah. if the, the slave consoles go to a song where there's been a preamp change, the master console has to be online and go to that position where there, that preamp change has happened so that the correct push-pull happens for the slaves. Well, absolutely, right. absolutely. Otherwise and that, 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 happens yeah. even, that happens even if just in a, a regular Pro Tools recording, right? If, you, if you yeah. record, you, you're working on recording, but since then you've changed the gains, then of course it's not, it's not going to work for you. So, um, yeah, you would have to get back to that trim position, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. I mean, as, as a that's kind of the only caveat, sense. really. I mean, short of that, if you're working on static gain, static preamp gain at the master, any of those consoles, any of the slave consoles will work flawlessly in virtual sound check, uh, regardless of where they are in the show. Yeah. And you can have redundant recording at all three positions, right? You can from the C totally. to D. Yeah. 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 So in this situation, you could have up to six recorders uh, recording there. It's pretty spectacular. Great question. No, we we knew we, we nearly were going to do a diagram, but we thought maybe yeah. it was too much. And as Robert said, he's made an amazing video, uh, which you can find on the Tinter Web, explaining all of that in, in, in great detail. Maybe we can post the link here. Uh, it, is there a place where you can publicly post the link there, Dirk? Uh, I think we can probably add it to the chat. Um, I will. Uh, I will put that in shortly. Okay, thanks. That'd be great. Um, so kind of a follow-up question to this. Uh, can I play back one Pro Tools system and record on another that will include my live tracks and Pro Tools tracks? I can take this. Um, if you have... Um, so the way this works uh, with virtual sound check, right, is that there's, there's basically a Y split. Once you patch in a mic pre, that will actually then also take up a Pro Tools stream. So that stream automatically goes to Pro Tools. You can have up to a, a maximum of 128 if you have a supported Mac, which is basically a Mac Pro or one of the latest generations Mac Minis, right? Don't do this on a MacBook Pro. It's not supported and I would suggest stay away from AVB 128 for this, right? But if you have, for example, one to eight, or even within 64 streams, if you only have a band that uses, say, 24, um, 24 inputs, then 24 streams, if you don't patch in the other streams, then 24 streams are in use for virtual sound check. The rest of the Pro Tools patch bay is then available as input streams. So if you manage those streams correctly, yes, you could. Right. Um, 
is it the 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 most easy convenient way of doing it nah, may, maybe not but yes it's totally possible and actually i've done it so there you go um you can actually have um separate play in in coming uh, AVB streams and then AVB streams dedicated to uh, virtual sound check or record. You just have to manage it yourself uh, by managing those 64 blocks or the 128 block. Mm. I think I think the question might be about putting it onto the network of the three desks. So um, to get that to get the playback onto the network of the three desks, it is going to have to go into the stage IO ring, right? That is going to have to go to the stage IO ring or Maybe watch the last webinar of this series. Yeah, that's exactly um, what I was about to say. <laughs> go on, right, no, John. Then to... you you can be indiscreet and give it away. Maybe. You, you tell well, I was going to say, you know, if you've got Milan cards in your system, you can share inputs between all your systems. So you could have virtual yeah. playback coming into one system and then feed it to your other two systems on your network. Uh, absolutely. Uh, currently, we can't do it, but we are going to show you on the fifth of these webinars, as uh, as Ryan just explained. Part of the big secret of Venue 7. Yeah. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> cool. Yeah, um, you know, again, kind of a follow up to this. I'm using Pro Tools to build an effects rack and want my recording to include the effects. Ooh, that sounds like a Ryan question. Yeah, you, you, could, you could make that happen. You'd have to use direct outs on that channel, though. Um, so, you know, you get your effects returns back into your console and then you just turn on the direct out for that channel and go to the Pro Tools patch bay and just feed those back in. That'll allow you to record not just the stage input so you have a clean input, but then you can also record various effects returns. Yeah. And if you need to do a virtual sound check that way without actually having that Pro Tools rig attached, again, you know, to generate these effects, you'd still be able to have both, you know, the, the, the clean channel and then, you know, affected returns. You're brave. I would do you that. Are brave. You're very brave. Hats off. All right. We've got one kind of a general final question here, which is, um, it, uh, can you guys uh, comment on maybe what are the, what are the differences? Like how does, you know, how does our IO sharing compare to some of the other live systems out there? Like what's the user experience like? It's much, much better. <laughs> we, don't, we don't want to talk about other people's I.O. sharing. I'm sure everybody has their own way of doing it. Um, we, 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 no, very, very I, I, I will say this, though. And, um, no, we, we don't have to go into the details, but I will say this, you know, and we touched on it earlier on. It's, it's all in that game parameter, right? It's, it's every, uh, the, the secret sauce, I would almost say, of, of the way that we do I.O. sharing is in that gain parameter that we use. Under the hood, we are very similar to what other systems do. Basically, you have one mic pre, there can only be one guy controlling that head amp, right? That's the what we call the master. The other guys, they're doing some sort of trim as opposed to what that head amp is set at. Now, uh, we don't use trim as a value to make you do that, right? And this is also what allows us to switch those master-slave relationships so easy because you have that gain value there. If you change, if you're Mike Reed, taking back the, the earlier example where the, the master is set at plus 40 and the, the, the slave is set at plus 38, if you change that relationship, that slave value will just propagate to that physical Mike Reed and tell that Mike Reed to set itself at plus 38 instead of plus 40. Now, if there was an effective two different parameters, like plus 38 plus a minus two, well, what do you do with that trim value? You, you, you don't really have a way to go with that trim value, right? So yeah, it's, it's yeah, a way, it's a way to, to, that we've always done is a way to, to make you work intuitively to not have to be thinking about what's going on. You're, you're not thinking about the system itself or the network or the, the, the way that the desk operates. You're just working as you've always worked. You're working with a gain and a pad, and 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 uh, and it's comfortable and it's natural. And uh, I think the uh, best thing you can do is have a great result in a way that's easy to achieve, right? I you know, one example, and I, I actually do know uh, an example where uh, a band went in and and took their old 
uh, profile show files and went straight into an IO sharing scenario. Now in the profile days, we didn't even do IO sharing, right? There was no, no gain sharing or IO sharing at those days, but still you could have a front of house and a monitor console with each their own show file. Those guys walked straight into an SXL scenario, into IO sharing, each loaded up their desk and boom, they were ready to go. Didn't have to change the thing. And I know, ex I know exactly who you're talking about, um, well, boy. And, uh, and the, um, and then the first thing he said is, what have you changed? It sounds amazing. It sounds better than it's ever sounded um, with exactly the same show file. Yeah. You know, I, I would add this one piece of insight to that uh, that uh, is probably worth stating. I think maybe probably the main difference between our uh, gain tracking and uh, the competitor gain trackers is that, you know, we have the entire range of gain available uh, to either console, meaning the master or the slave. And what that allows the, the person who is the slave to do is actually start setting gain on a microphone regardless of where uh, that master console is sitting. Whereas in you know a lot of competitor consoles, the trim portion of that is an abbreviated version of the gain. Mm. So they don't have the entire range available to them. So that, that really is one of our secret sauces uh, in our input sharing and gain tracking model. You know? And then all the variants, right? We, we... We do compensate always, you know, everything is always compensated, no matter who. Yeah. yeah. All the other variants out there where you, you know, sometimes you have to lock out the master gain and both go into trim or whatever. I would also right? add, uh, Chris, the flexibility of the IO. You know, we can use the stage 64, stage 32, stage 16. Oh, yeah. And all True. of that math is done for us. We don't have to rethink it. Uh, you can use a stage six, you know, four stage 16s one day, move over to stage 64 the other day. And uh, it's all calibrated as you would expect. Yep. Yeah, nice one, Chad. Yeah, I think we've I think we logged that one down, Derek. This this is there anything else? No, that's it. You know, I uh, you know I do th think the one you know one thing we should point out is is we have a lot of a lot of deep dives on this. I mean, whether it's things about the Luminex switches, um, you know, that were part of I think Venue six point three uh, release. Um, you know, we have a lot of blogs that have been written by 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 the product management team. Lots of videos uh, by Rob and Chris and Robert. Um, you know, over the years that you know that really deep dive on these things. So I would just encourage everyone. You know, go to the SXL product pages. There are a bunch of tutorials at the bottom of the learn and support, which I just put in the chat. Uh, also, avidblogs.com. There's a whole section just for live sound. Lots and lots of good material, deep dive material there as well. So. Just encourage people to explore that. Beautiful. I think that's taken us just just slightly past the hour. Um, anybody have any last thoughts they want to add uh, before before I, I call it? Ryan done a great job. I'd just like to publicly thank you for the job you've done on this. Seven is the most exciting software we've we've seen since since we've been working at Avid. I've been working here for fourteen years. Um, Absolute great job. Just wanted to publicly say that, man. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, Absolutely. It's going to be fun yeah. for everybody. It's a lot of fun right now. I'm dying to show you all this <laughs> shit we've got going on behind me, but I can't. We're saving it. We're saving it bit by bit. We're living, giving you it bit by bit. Yeah. Okay. So thanks, everybody. Uh, Genius. Thanks, Rob, Dirk, Ryan, Chant, Rokoto, Chris, all the usual team, Sarah, and Hill. Um, we're going to do it again in a week's time where, where Rob will be driving and, and, and we'll be in the stands cheering him on, right? And uh, the next, do you want to say a little bit what, what you're doing, Robert, next week? Yeah, we're going to cover uh, some, uh, some of the uh, kind of operational features and some of the new things. We're specifically, going to spend some time with heat, uh, which is a saturation emulation that is now included on every input channel of the console. Yee-hoo! So uh, going to be going through that in detail as well. It's going to be a fun one. Be sure and tune in. Awesome. See you there. Listen, thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining. Thanks for watching and asking the questions. Great questions as ever. Um, all the best. See you again.